Thank you, Pat. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum. Tonight we'll be discussing human rights in China after the Olympics with Jean Li Yang. I'm Richard Zeckhauser, professor of political economy at Harvard's Kennedy School. The Olympics are now ended, and attention is turned away from China. But the big questions remain. Have human rights improved in the wake of those games, as the Chinese leaders promised? Faces, faced with ever-growing, cascading crises, a major earthquake, the world economic collapse, the Tibetan <laughs> uprising, pervasive pollution, how has the current leadership responded? Does viable democratic opposition survive within China today? Could that opposition advance the nation's agenda? What role can the international community play in moving China toward democracy? These are some of the questions to be addressed tonight by our speaker, John Lee Yang. Yang earned doctoral degrees from both Harvard University and the University of California, the first in public policy, the latter in mathematics. He is a survivor of the Tiananmen Square massacre and served a five-year term in China, prison term in China. 15 months of that was in solitary confinement. In spring 2008, Dr. Yang walked 500 miles from Boston to Washington to increase public awareness of China's human rights abuses. In July, he attempted to return to China during the Olympics and was nearly arrested when he tried to carry his message of democracy. He was then turned away. Widely recognized as a leading architect of the Chinese pro-democracy movement, Dr. Yang is president of the pro-democracy organization, Initiative for China. He is a penetrating scholar, an activist for democracy, a fierce patriot, and a man of uncommon courage. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Jean Li Yang. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zach Hauser. You are always so kind to me. Uh, Professor Zach Hauser uh, is my mentor. Uh, today, at, as uh, when I was uh, a student at Harvard, he's uh, so important to me, and he is uh, a source of inspiration and support. Thank you very much for your unwavering support. Thank you, everybody, for coming to uh, this talk, and uh, thank you, Pat, for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight to this wonderful audience. So, the, as uh, Professor Zach Hauser just said, the Beijing Olympics then ended, and the Beijing Olympics certainly drew the attention of the world to the People's Republic of China. That, of course, had been the intention of the Chinese leaders who applied for the games in 19, uh, early 1990s, gave uh, the world uh, many promises which they uh, did not deliver before, during, and after Olympics. The intention China has got has not all been of the kind the Chinese leaders were hoping for. The world, as fascinated by the spectacular opening ceremony and a strong performance of the Chinese athletes, as it might have been, also saw the country where people were still imprisoned for criticizing their government, for calling for change, or even for drawing attention to social issues such as the AIDS epidemic. The world saw the country where corrupt officials were exploiting and mistreating workers and the peasants, and where those people had no right of redress. The world saw a country where there were no free trade unions and where industrial health and safety were ignored in factories and mines. The world saw a country where people were still persecuted for their religious beliefs. Quite unfortunately, the world did not see any sign of change in China 
before, during, and after the Olympics, as many good people in the world had hoped for. And the world is continuing to see a country where the people, 1.3 billion people, a fifth of the population of the world, have no right to choose their own government, but live under an authoritarian regime which came seize the power by armed force 60 years ago and has ever since refused even to consider relinquishing power or allowing the people a say in their own government. The lesson we have learned this time as before is again that there will be no real democratic change in China until there is an internationally recognized and a supported viable democratic opposition. And for that, there must be well-organized democratic forces. But the question is, what are holding us back from achieving this preliminary goal? To answer this question is very difficult because China is a very complicated country. Talking about China, to try to find a solution for China's future is almost as difficult as finding a parking in half the square, <laughs> just as <laughs> Professor Zach Hauser said. Um, let me elaborate, elaborate based on my personal experience. Let me begin with my personal experience. In my five year imprisonment, I experienced firsthand the games played between repressive prison authorities and repressed prisoners. With unlimited power, prison guards constantly use the following methods against prisoners. Stark naked violence, intimidation of violence, degradation and humiliation, isolation, monopolization of perception, brainwashing, harassment, and psychological torture, induced debility and exhaustion, occasional indulgence, enforcing trivial demands, arbitrary intrusion of privacy, and so on and so forth. At the same time, capitalizing on prisoners' fear and their demands for the reduction of prison terms and other privileges. Guards constantly exploit prisoners and their families economically. Not until I was put in prison did I have any idea that a jailer is a such profitable occupation. How do prisoners react? On one hand, they harbor such a bitter hatred toward the prison authorities and even the entire society that they would, if they could, destroy all the social establishments and torture the guards more than the guards torture them. On the other hand, under long time persecution and fear, they have been unknowingly transformed into founding slaves, doing everything possible to win favor with the guards, and even competing with other prisoners for pitiful benefits and for domineering position over other inmates. It is fair to say that a Chinese prison, both in behavior and in psycho psychology, is a mix of tyrants, mobs, and slaves. I became intent on creating and cultivating a new and a different environment, a civil and healthy environment, without which things would undoubtedly go about in an indefinite vicious circle. Despite extremely unfavorable circumstances, my efforts achieved a limited success. I learned the following. First, somebody, in this specific case myself, needs to protest with moral courage 
awakening and inspiring the conscience of inmates and guards alike. Second, issues should be carefully selected and strategies wisely chosen to achieve small victories, especially at first, which may strengthen the confidence that actions are necessary and can produce positive results. And last, not least, outside support is vitally important. Although there is no perfect analogy, Chinese autocracy, in a sense, is a prison at large, with its authorities relentlessly persecuting and even seeking to annihilate its civil and healthy elements. As a result, Chinese society is, to a large extent, also a mix of tyrants, mobs, and slaves. Our challenge, again, is how to nurture new and different elements, civil and healthy ones, in present-day China. Until we see a solution to this question, China will remain hopeless, because after all, neither tyrants nor mobs nor slaves can create a truly civil society. Now, let me get to the China labyrinth. Many people assume that the reason for the delay in transition to a democratic China is because the Chinese people, especially the Chinese ruling elites, do not understand democracy, let, al let alone its essential importance to the country's future. This, this is not the case. During the nearly four months I stayed in China, following my release on April 27th of last year, I met and had meaningful conversations with about 200 friends, old and new. They are from different political backgrounds and various professions, from dissidents to incumbent government officials, from peasants and taxi drivers to, to renowned professors and successful entrepreneurs, from freelance web writers to official journalists, from show business people to retired senior party officials. These personal interactions with Chinese people living in China actually began more than five years before when I entered China in April 2002, I interviewed nearly 100 migrant and employed workers during the short period of freedom before my arrest. These interactions continued during my imprisonment. I seized every opportunity possible to exchange views with my inmates and guards on various questions concerning democratization in China. Almost none of the people I met in the past years denounced the intrinsic importance of democracy to China's future. And almost everyone agreed that democracy is inevitable. Although they might disagree on how long it will take to realize and who will and should pay the price and take the risk of potential transitional disorders. I also discovered that in general, the ruling elites have exposed themselves to a significantly large extent to Western democratic theories and practices. It is fair to say that they understand what democracy is almost as well as we do. Now, if these people have a good understanding of democracy, realize its vital importance to the future of China, and accept its ine inevitability, then why has a real democratic transition not yet begun in China? The standard answer to this question is that the ruling elites do not want to loosen their grip on political power because they are unwilling to give up their vested 
privileges. Who does? The answer is absolutely right. But the story does not simply end there. The better question is, what distinguishes China from other autocracies? Many autocratic societies, left wing and right wing, eastern and western, began the process of democratization even under a less favorable international environment when the universal standards of human rights were much less acknowledged worldwide. Why not China even today? The Chinese difference lies in the unique history of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP's rule in China. In its nearly 60 years of rule in China, the CCP has conducted two diametrically contradicting pieces of the devil's business. At first, the CCP forced the Chinese people under the gun to surrender their private properties to the state so as to establish the comprehensive planned economy. And later, in the name of reform, with the protection of the gun, the CCP has, by force or trickery, stolen and continues to steal public property and put it into the private pockets of its officials and their associates. As a result, the CCP has turned China into a political power monopolized Leninist, cronist market economy with Chinese characteristics. In this process of a falling in, after falling out, almost every member of the ruling elite has been trapped by the double sense of being political persecutor and economic embezzler. So political change might not only be a political question for them, neither does it only mean the surrender of vested privileges. It may well lead to serious lawsuits or even violent mob revenge against them. If the CCP had done only one of the two evil businesses, the former one, for example, things would be much easier. If so, when political change takes place, the ruling elites could possibly get away by attributing the responsibilities to political ideals, to government of higher levels, or even to dead leaders such as Mao and Deng. They could say things like, we conducted government business in that way because we believed in communism. I did this as I carried the order from above. Or we had just been deceived by Mao and had done everything he told us to do, and so on and so forth. But now I just cannot imagine how they could rationalize both evils. How can each of them explain serious embezzlement? They cannot easily say, I am corrupt because of my political ideals. Or President Jiang Zemin told me to make money with political power. Or President Hu Jintao told me to steal. The ruling elites have no confidence in any political change. Their evil steps and their fear of the future have led them to the conclusion that the status quo is the only safe haven for them. So their first political priority is to stall the democratization process as long as they can, even with pressures from both inside and outside. This mentality and the policy were clearly embodied before and during the Beijing Olympics. The CCP's political paralysis has trapped itself and China in a vicious circle. Initial resistance to political reform, which aggravates already existing problems and accumulates new ones, 
This in turn increases the tensions, which then increase the risk, risks that any reform could get out of control. This further deters the CCP from undertaking any reform, thus further fueling state-society tensions as individual and collective grievances continue to accumulate, compounding the risks of a future reform. It is, however, an impossible task for the CCP government to theorize and to convince people that the two opposing businesses are both right. In fact, the gap made by the illegitimacy of a CCP's rule cannot be crossed, even if it has taken pains to build bridges one after another from Marxism to Mao Zedong thought, from Mao Zedong thought to Deng Xiaoping theory, from Deng Xiaoping theory to three represents, and from three represents to harmonious society and scientific development views. Granted, it was the Chinese people who chose the communists as their rulers in 1949. However, the CCP cannot provide any justification why such a choice forever deprives the people of choosing again. Moreover, the CCP one-party dictatorship has in the whole of Chinese history conducted the cruelest robbery of private property created the most bloody peacetime domestic turmoil, caused the most horrific peacetime starvation unrelated to any natural disaster. Moreover, the CCP has caused the greatest number of non-natural death in peacetime, created and continues to create the most numerous cases of injustice, perpetrated the most barbarous destruction of Chinese culture, historical relics, the natural environment, and the religious beliefs, wrought the most notorious crackdown on the student movement, and made and continues to produce the most widespread government corruption, human rights violation, the most unjust income disparity, and in the name of socialism, has left the country basically without a social safety net. Both in theory and in practice, the legitimacy of a CCP's rule is without foundation. The only straw to which the CCP clutches is a fast economic growth. The slogan strongly promoted by the CCP in recent years, growth is the hard truth stem from this hard fact. Yet, the fruits of the economic growth are not justly distributed. The ruling elites have been systematically pilfered in the course of the China economic development. Permitting graph in exchange for loyalty, the CCP has tolerated pre predatory practices on all levels as long as mass grievances and protests caused by the predation can be brought under control. The form of predation varies with the level of a government. The central and provincial governments are more like a stationary bandit acting like the master of the house instead of a robber, and thus doing something to pretend that their encompassing interest is akin to the national interest. But the local governments and their officials behave essentially like roving band bandits, exploiting the powerless and scrupulous, exploiting the powerless and scrupulously. <coughs> Grievances are mounting. The number of the incidents of a collective protests has risen to about 100,000 per year. It is even more telling 
if you consider that protest protesters face a severe crackdown and almost without the encouragement of previous successes. In order to ensure that stability is above all without caring to solve the fundamental problems with the political system, the CCP continues to expand and update its police troops. About 4.6 million well-paid and well-equipped police are standing ready to crack down upon and persecute at any time what they call unstable elements around the country. Make no mistake about it, China is a 100% police state. Nevertheless, the CCP is on the defense in the field of political rights, with resistance not only from outside, but more importantly from within. The political rights lag much behind the personal liberties, and more and more people have come to realize that without the protection of political rights, their social economic rights can be and actually are arbitrarily violated. Land grab cases in countryside and forced demolition and eviction cases in the city, people subjected to the harm of poisonous food, about three typical examples. Protests against rights violations and voices demanding political reform are besieging the communist regime on all sides. Although it understands that it is on the wrong side of history, the CCP has not enough confidence, perhaps not the capacity, to welcome a democratic transition. Instead, it tightly defends what it considers the line of life. From the above analysis, we can say that the Chinese government is a one-party dictatorship whose claims of legitimacy are increasingly hollow. The CCP government is in fact a 100% police state, which is making a last-ditch political defense while continuing to be economically predatory. The question is, given all I have said, where do our hopes lead? Where do our hopes lie? Or what can and should we do to advance democracy in China? People often talk about prerequisites for democratization. For me, the most important of all is that there must be democratic forces, the organized, civil, and healthy elements in Chinese society. Then, how can we nurture such forces in China? Neither tyrants nor slaves can be counted on, nor mobs who would, share, nor mobs who would scare the ruling elites into more headstrong defense. Drawing on my personal experience in prison, I believe that in order for democratic forces to thrive in China, somebody must first stand out with moral courage and vision to openly challenge in every field the undemocratic way of life, thus encouraging tyrants, mobs, and slaves toward civil and healthy elements. Secondly, Continuously improving organizational work and strategies are needed to merge civil and healthy elements into democratic forces and to secure some initial success advances, thus convincing people that actions are necessary and productive and inspiring more people to join. Thirdly, continued support from the international community is most vital. The good news is that more and more civil and healthy elements have surfaced in virtually every geographical area, profession, social class, and even political background. I have many, many names here. I'm not going to read them. But the bad news is that they are scattered. 
They lack unified organization, widely accepted leadership, and commonly shared long-term goals, democratization strategies, and principles of actions. These three aspects are actually both cause and effects of one another. These three factors are indispensable to facilitate communication, concerted efforts, and to include and transform all grievances, protests, independent, independent thoughts and voices into a movement toward a constitutional democracy. Without them, the democratic forces can only operate on a very low level without impact on the overall situation. Knowing what we need is knowing what we should do. All my work here is essentially to assist my colleagues back in China in every way possible so we can successfully bring together these three factors of moral leadership, improved international organiza internal organization of democratic forces, and the continued support of the international community. We will not be able to go very far without the strong commitment from the international community, particularly the United States, to support the Chinese democratic forces, both in and outside China. China is now open to the world, and its leadership can no longer afford to ignore the international pressures, voices, and norms. So the United States should, on every occasion possible, bring human rights issues to China, be it economic talks or cultural exchange. Even a single request for the release of an individual prisoner of conscience can have a significant impact. All this effort can help enlarge the public political space in China. In fact, in the past 20 years, the human rights talks, which the Chinese democracy movement, international rights groups, and the U.S. government have pressed China to engage, have helped raise the Chinese public awareness of human rights to a visible degree. To keep China's door open is very important, and I have never opposed the engagement with China, but I believe today more than ever that a visionary part of the engagement policy is to openly and systematically engage with the Chinese democratic forces and to nurture their growth toward becoming the most reliable leverage to limit the arbitrary and predatory power of the CCP regime and to cultivate a positive changes in China. For the business community, I would like you to realize that the legitimacy of the CCP's rule is hanging on by just the one string of economic growth. GDP in the region is the single most important criterion for local leaders' performance evaluation. They, especially local leaders, want you to do business there regardless of your stand on human rights issues. A lot of fear is actually self-imposed. During the period of a South African people's struggle against apartheid, a great American citizen, Leon Sullivan, authored the Sullivan Principles to help the US business community exercise their collective strength to defend fundamental values of human dignity. I respectfully suggest that the American business community do the same when they're dealing with China. We hopeful, but cannot rely on the Chinese autocratic rulers initiative to open up the field of the political rights. A democratic transition in China is, mostly, is most likely to come with the growth of a popular democratic forces. Our hope lies with them. Our duty is to nurture their growth. Thank you. Thank you very much.
you're joining Cambridge Forum discussing human rights in China after the Olympics with Dr. John Lee Yang. Um, I'd like to ask you a question, if I might. Yeah. Um, one of the most remarkable things about China over the even last decade and a half has been its remarkable record of economic growth. It's achieved double-digit growth over this whole period, has impressed the world, and most economic projections say that if China continues on this course, it will have the largest economy in the world uh, within a, the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, up until about 10 years ago, Western economists believed that economies couldn't really develop and thrive unless they had democracy. Witnessing a variety of Asian countries, and most importantly China, that view has slowly shifted to think that authoritarian regimes, and China certainly fits that category, you would go further than that, say uh, a police state, um, actually can perform very well economically. And I'm just wondering, do you think that strong economic growth over a sustained period, including becoming the leader in the world, is consistent with not having democracy, however undesirable? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a very good question. China's uh, economic growth has been remarkably fast in the past 30 years, with double-digit uh, growth rate every year. And um, the major um, drive force behind it is the people's crea creativity. You know, the, if we can remember in uh, uh, 30 years ago when the reform just began, what the Chinese government did. What it did is not regulate the peasants what they should farm, what should they grow and sell. And the pe peasants first have the freedom to grow their own, uh, what, whatever plants they want to grow, uh, crops they want to grow. So I just cite this example as, you know, before the economic reform, the Chinese economy was totally um, uh, totalitarian plant economy. So people had no freedom. So all of a sudden, people have a freedom, economic freedom to a certain degree. That pushed the economy to develop very fast. But at the same time, people have uh, hopes, they hope it's uh, the, the economic growth will lead to the political liberal, liberalization. And in this country, there is a prevailing uh, uh, idea that commerce will eventually lead to democracy. But as Professor Zekhausa pointed out, this uh, idea become uh, uh, kind of um, uh, shaky because China pretty much provide a model with rest, uh, fast uh, economic growth, but with a one-party political system. So Professor Zekhaus's question is, can this model sustainable? Can it last for a sustained period of time? Uh, my answer is no. The reason is, when people have enjoyed uh, personal liberty because of the economic growth, because the uh, economic rights, they will demand more. If you go to China, you talk to the general uh, public, so everybody demands for freedom. They may not say that in the language we are familiar with, in the language we want, you know, we uh, commonly use, but they demand. That's that's our hope based on, and this force will eventually become uh, a driving force to change China. And when I think there are three uh, prevailing uh, ideas about future China. One is, uh, 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 the one, uh, one is uh, we call it uh, uh, Jim Mann in his book, The China Fantasy, he called it a uh, soothing scenario that is commerce lead automatically to democracy. That's the prevailing uh, idea. The second is uh, upheaval uh, scenario, uh, which 
uh, predict China is headed to uh, collapse, a uh, political disintegration and economic collapse. And the third uh, prevailing idea is that China will continue on the path of economic growth and with a repressive one-party political system. I think the three of them all have a problem. The problem they have in common is that they overlook democratic forces in China. If you take that into account, you know, sooner or later, China will change. A change is not because commerce automatically lead to democracy. So we do need some people, we do need a democratic forces to push for democracy. Commerce alone cannot change China politically. So the, so the first scenario is wrong because they overlooked, uh, 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 it, 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 it's wrong because they think uh, commerce automatically lead to democracy without doing anything. The second upheaval scenario is wrong because they overlook the healthy civil elements in China, which will hold China together. I don't think China will collapse uh, 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 on the way toward democracy. And the third scenario, which is uh, uh, the Chinese model scenario, is, which is uh, China continue on the path of economic growth with a uh, repressive uh, one-party political system. This can coexist for a sustained uh, period of time. That's wrong because it overlooked the existing democratic forces which will sooner or later change China, will bring a democracy in China. I'd like to ask you one more question and then turn it over to the audience. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you two stories. Mm -hmm. The first story you're well familiar with, which is that when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, he thought that they had been slaves in Egypt, yeah. and they couldn't go to the promised land because they still had the slave mentality. Mm -hmm. and they had to wander for 40 years in the desert. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who say that the same is true of the Chinese people, that no one currently alive has ever lived under democracy in China, and we will need some external element to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the second story is I was not in China, but I was in um, some countries with significant numbers of Chinese people this spring, including Hong Kong, which is, of course, in some sense part of China. And I asked the people about democracy in part because uh, Zhang Li Yang is my student. And a number of them said, including people who were uh, quite well educated and quite successful, they said, you should understand the Chinese people are different than Western people. They don't really value democracy the way you do. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, will you comment on those two? Oh, yes. So I like the first story, which tells us a lot of things. People love freedom but oftentimes they do not want to sacrifice for it. So when Moses led Israelites out of Egypt, they suffered hardship. Because of the hardship, many of the Israelites wanted to go back, wanted to go back to Egypt. So we will enter, we will enter, encounter such a situation when we uh, do the work to advance democracy in China. So people loved freedom but oftentimes we understand people do not want to sacrifice for it. Mm. That's number one, that's my comment. Number two, and uh, the good answer to the question is, if we take universal declaration of human rights to China and ask anybody you meet on the street, whether do they want the rights described in the Universal Declaration in the language they can understand. I don't think you will meet anybody who would say no. So people want freedom, whether it uh, doesn't matter where they live, when they live, a hundred years ago, a hundred years after. So that's the universal. Universal value, people demand for. And number, another way to answer this question is, if 
you know, often, oftentimes we can hear this argument, while well, Chinese people are different. They don't want democracy. If the, you know, those who uh, hold this uh, assertion and the Chinese government may like this uh, uh, assertion, so they, why, why do not let the Chinese people to cast ballot on the question whether they want democracy, right? So I think everybody intrinsically want a say in their own government, no matter whether they are Chinese or American. So we, that, there's a danger when we, whenever we engage in the talk with the Chinese people. Uh, Natan Sharansky, a, a, a great Israelite, uh, uh, wrote a book, A Case for Democracy. In this great book, he described the situation, uh, described the, you know, the people uh, in this situation as double thinkers. So they, because of the fear, they cannot freely express their will. And over time, they may forget they have this demand. And uh, oftentimes, the all of foreigners visiting China meet with those elites. Elites enjoy good life in China, privileges co-opted by the Chinese government. They rely very much on the regime for their good standing in the society. Of course, they don't want democracy. So there's a danger when we talk to people to get the statistics from China. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. We're at Cambridge Forum with Zhang Li Yang discussing human rights in China after the Olympics. Uh, we'd like the audience to come forward and come to the microphone. And remember, uh, we want you to ask a question, uh, not just make a statement. Yes, uh, do you <clears throat> what do you think is the likelihood of someone like uh, uh, Gorbachev, uh, only a Chinese, a Chinese Gorbachev coming to power uh, who would implement something like glasnost or, and or uh, perestroika, mm -hmm. uh, leading, leading to either, either more democracy or if, if not the end of, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, it could lead to the end of democracy, the, the end of communism as it did in the Soviet Union, or it could come to a different outcome. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of that possibility? Uh -huh. Okay, 20 years ago, it was very clear who in the party are the reformers who were uh, conservatives, but now it's very, very unclear. So I think that uh, in terms of interest, the whole party think they um, share the same interest that, that to hold this, uh, to, to store the democracy process in China. That's, uh, that's, that's something they all agree to. So it's very difficult to, it's very difficult for China's political system to produce a figure, political figure like uh, Gorbachev. Very difficult. I would not say uh, impossible. I, th I would say extremely difficult, extremely difficult. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, I have a two-part question. The first question is uh, for Dr. Uh, Zeckhauser. Uh, under the spirit of freedom of information, how good a student was Dr. Yang while you were uh, <laughs> tutoring, mentoring him? Uh, Dr. Yang was a <laughs> remarkable student. You should understand that while he was getting his PhD with me, working on uh, quite abstract mathematical models, he was also running around the world writing books, raising money, giving speeches to people. Cambridge is easy, but he was giving speeches to people all over the globe. So um, <laughs> he would only drop in from time to time and produce a thesis chapter. It's, it's not something, I actually think he has a twin brother who looks the same. <laughs> that was the right response. Uh, my second question is to Dr. Young. You mentioned uh, Natan Sharansky's book, The Case for Democracy. Yep. In that book, uh, he uh, attributes a statement to uh, the Soviet-era dissident, Dr. Uh, Zakharov, I believe, S Zakharov. that uh, uh, world go governments or world, the world community cannot rely 
on governments who do not rely do not, on their uh, own people. Yeah. I'd like you to comment on that relative to what the implications of that statement is or are relative to uh, the U.S. policy towards uh, China and human rights. And if you could look uh, the new president-elect in the eye, uh -huh. what recommendations would you give him for a more uh, coherent uh, foreign policy towards China? Thank you. So this is a, a very good question. And uh, so why we care about democracy in China, in this country? China is a far away on another hemisphere of the globe. So why we care? We care because of first and most for uh, the Chinese people, of course. But you just pick a dictator in anywhere in the world you will find that China is supporting him. So China's existence, I mean the uh, continued uh, economic growth with repressive one-party political system, if this model uh, lasts for uh, a, a sustained period of time, it certainly will pose a problem to the value, democratic value globally. And the China not only, China's support to the dictators is not merely symbolic. They support the dictators with a tangible, tangible assistance, military, economic, and also ide ideological sustenance. So it's, uh, I think it's in the interest of these people to defend the value of a democracy Number one, number two, when we all when we talk to um, uh, uh, people in this country, especially uh, academic elites and the business elites, they, I can see the fear in them, because they want to have some relationship with the dictators in China. In this country, as American scholars, they cannot freely criticize Chinese government in the public settings. If they do, if they ever do, they do it in the private settings or, or in a very small economical circle. So we see that happening from time to time and always, almost everywhere, always. So I always say fear is exported from China. I mean, is, um, um, uh, China exports fear globally. And the ideological, uh, uh, dictator ideolo ideology globally. And uh, there were also uh, campaigns uh, that we saw. Uh, people uh, formed parties, uh, they mm -hmm. had uh, campaigns uh, for people. Uh, we did get to go to a number of the uh, uh, various events uh, that the different uh, political parties I'm not aware enough of the relationship between Taiwan uh, historically and the current leadership in uh, you know, the, uh, uh, China to understand what impact that has. Uh, there are definitely, certainly from my experience in the uh, Taiwan aspect of China, was a very active democracy. But is that something that is not helpful to export, as it were, because the people in the rest of China see that as a remnant of the earlier uh, royalist, and I got the word wrong, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the part of the government that was uh, connected more to the pre-revolutionary, or can that actually be a model of some sort? And then my second question has to do with Tibet. Uh, I, I would appreciate whatever comments you can make about what you think the current status of the discussions between China and Tibet are. Thank you for your questions. First, Taiwan most importantly provides a model of democracy, a counter example to the theory that Chinese culture is not commensurate with democracy. So Taiwan, of course, is in the greater Chinese culture and China, uh, Taiwan people have 
successfully brought their country, brought democracy to their country. So, which uh, uh, provide an uh, encouraging uh, example for the people in mainland China. M more and more Chinese people in mainland China take uh, Taiwan as uh, a good example of democratization and uh, look at Taiwan as the future of China. If you get on the web, uh, Chinese people followed, inside China followed uh, the election campaign in Taiwan. And you can hear, you can, uh, hear people talking about uh, Taiwan's democracy. From that, you can clearly see people have a demand for democracy like what the Taiwan people have. And so Taiwan is very important for, uh, for mainland China. And uh, of course, the issue is very complicated in before revolution, after revolution, and uh, the Kuomintang government, the current government, uh, recently adopted a policy which leaned toward to the mainland China. <coughs> to me, it's too much, which already caused a protest from the voters in Taiwan. Just uh, two weeks ago, 600,000 Taiwan, Taiwanese took to the street protesting uh, um, President Ma ying policy toward China. So that's the, you know, it's a complicated issue. We can uh, 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 go on talking it uh, for quite a long time. I would like to answer your uh, second question at this point. Tibet, of course, is a, Tibet, the issue of Tibet is very important, not only for the Tibetan people, of course, it's very important for Tibetan people, but also important for the uh, future of the people of the Republic of China. I call people of the Republic of China because when we say China, it is, it's kind of uh, sensitive. So people of the Republic of China is an existing uh, entity. So uh, under people of the Republic of China, Tibet exists. So I say it's not only for the future of the Tibetans, but also for the people who live, are living uh, in People's Republic of China. And I had a meeting just two months ago with uh, the Dalai Lama for, for one hour, a private meeting. In that meeting, and we talked about uh, the future of, of course, the future of Tibetan and his strategy, the strategy he has taken for 20 years. And he admitted that does not work. And uh, I um, directly, straightforwardly pointed to him uh, in the past 20 years, he tried to represent the Tibetan people to strike a deal with the Chinese government. That won't happen because the Chinese government will not grant freedom to Tibetan without granting freedom to the Chinese Han, to Uyghurs, to Mongolians. So it won't happen. So if China ever changes, it will be the result of the joint effort of all the ethnic groups. And he agreed and he, he is willing to join the uh, um, uh, democratic movement. And uh, just a, a week ago, he uh, make, made an announcement that he would give up upon talks with the Chinese government. And uh, he said he will quit leader, political leadership for the Tibetans and let the Tibetans decide for themselves the future direction. So just uh, uh, this question is very good because uh, this weekend we are going to have a conference which is called the uh, Inter-Ethnic Conference, uh, Inter-Ethnic Leadership Conference. In this conference, we will discuss the issues of uh, uh, the future of the Tibetans and the future of the other ethnic groups in China. And uh, to me, we have to, our cause is common cause. We just cannot separately achieve our own goals. 
we have to work together, number one. Number two, whether, um, no matter what you, you are pursuing, we have to have a constitutional starting point which we all agree to, which we all trust. From there, whatever you get is credible. So, so uh, my idea is we work together for a constitutional democracy for all. Then from that constitutional order, you can pursue either independence or genuine autonomy, whatever, through the constitutional order, the procedure. Otherwise, whatever you get is, is you know, it's not accepted by other groups. It's about, uh, remind me again? Oh, oh, Confucian, Confucianism. Yeah. Uh, Confucius has been the most unfortunate figure in Chinese history. Uh, and um, all he has been frequently used as political tools for different uh, uh, rulers. And he uh, has uh, suffered uh, up and downs many times in the history of China. And in present day China, very, very few people understand what Confucius, Confuci Confucianism is. And uh, although the Chinese government is trying to use it to solidify its legitimacy to rule in China, and say, I'm the uh, inheritor of the Chinese culture, try to convince people like that. But most of the Chinese people do not know what Confucius is. And uh, so, Confucianism in China is political, not theoretical, not culture. And you can hear many Chinese scholars talking about Confucian, 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 Confucianism to save a world. I often challenge them saying, if you want to use Confucianism to save, China, to save the world or save China, you have to answer the first question, why it hasn't done so in China in the past 2000 and 500 years. So I think uh, uh, Chinese government is trying to use Confucianism to convince the people they have a legitimacy to rule in China. So I think for future China, Confucianism of course should be liberalized from a political uh, uh, use. And uh, people can have a free exchange of ideas. And uh, the sad, sad fact is, uh, very few people in China understand what it is. So it's good to China to, to not only travel to the cities, but to the countryside and to talk to people, of course, to various kind of people. That's a first-hand experience, but not everybody can do that. Number two, when we read, we should be careful. We should read all you know, uh, the books or the articles from all the point of view, from different angles. You, that can give you a sort of uh, overall idea what China will like, but still it's difficult. But another way to look at China is Look at the statistics, statistics, the numbers. When people talk to you, say, saying, oh, there are so many people uh, approve the government, uh, uh, the current government, uh, by uh, showing their support when they, uh, uh, the, the Olympics and the national flags, uh, the young people gather together to, sh to pay their respect or whatever, that's, you cannot rely on that kind of statistics for your judgment. 
Why? Because these activities are allowed and encouraged by the Chinese government. If you want to get a true situation in China, you have to look at the numbers of the activities, the scale of activities that the Chinese government does not allow or crack down on. If that exists, for example, in China, 100,000 collective protests take place per year now. So the protests are not encouraged, of course, not encouraged by China government. The protests would be cracked down by the Chinese government. Still, there's such a big number. That number can tell you the truth, but not the, the, the other number. But it's very difficult to get a, a truthful report from China. But of course, there's always a way to find out the truth. This will be our last question. How do you see the CCP reacting as the GDP growth slows or yeah. goes away? The growth slowed down will cause uh, uh, social unrest in China. That is, uh, 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 the Chinese government is uh, fearful. So, uh, China's, China, uh, China's economy develops very fast so that even the general ordinary people will benefit from it. But of course, it's, you know, the, 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 the distribution, distribution is not just. Although it is not just, but ordinary people benefit from it because they have a faster growth. But when the growth is thrown down, and ordinary people will feel the hardship. And uh, that will cause social unrest, definitely. Yeah, it will cause social unrest. I admit to getting a little lost in the thicket of some of your political critique, but so I just wanted to ask a personal question, which is, uh, you know, where did you grow up in China and what experience would you point to that sort of raised your political consciousness? Uh -huh. And could you say something about some of your friends uh, and uh, activists who are still in China who you knew during the Tiananmen uh, period and, and what they're doing now to uh, carry on their struggle okay. in, in a personal way. Okay, in a personal way, yeah, good. I was born to a party official's family. My father was um, a governor of a county in Shandong province. Uh, the culture revolution broke out when I was three years old. My father was uh, cracked down upon by rebels these rebels are, uh, support, were supported by the leader, the great leader, Mao, Mao, Mao Zedong. That, that, that is why they could do it. They just cracked down on almost every party officials, including my father. And uh, I, of course, uh, that has great impact on me and I, developed a hatred against those rebels. But a few years later, my father was put back in his uh, old position as the governor of a county, together with his colleagues. And they waged the campaign against the rebels. That campaign was even more brutal, hundreds of times brutal than rebels uh, treated them. And I, from that, I understand that there is something wrong in this political system. And even every party official was cracked down upon by rebels, but some are treated more harshly than others. I began to ask the question, why? These rebels actually stood up to revenge against those who persecuted in the past. Whoever persecuted them more, they will, pursue, they will uh, uh, revenge more. It's, it has nothing to do with political idea. It's just a uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 personal hatred, a personal revenge against each other. And I began to 
suspicious about what the party told us. And when I was um, uh, 12, there was a big flood in my uh, home, hometown, and I went to countryside to help the peasants. Uh, I found the peasants are star were starving, and uh, they basically just uh, had a very, uh, how to say it, kind of a thin soup of green, one bowl or two for each person for a day. And uh, the, most of them have no uh, mattress, no uh, 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 cover. They just uh, sl sl slap in a, in a pile of a straw. So that really uh, had a great impact on me. And uh, the Chinese government always taught us, you know, they changed China. They gave the people a happy life. And in the old society, and people suffered, starved to death, and whatever. And thanks to the leadership of the Communist Party, and everybody is living a happy life. Uh, so I found that's a lie. Then I began to uh, kind of um, um, sort of become a dissident when I was 12, and I often ran into argument with my father at the dinner table. And in a few cases, he almost sent me to uh, police. And uh, we argued fiercely about this. And uh, later, I went to college. I escaped a high school. I went to college. Uh, and um, kind of tired of politics and uh, tried to be, poli uh, to be um, uh, I worked very hard trying to be a mathematician. So I studied mathematics and came to, um, and went to graduate school. And in graduate school, I was recruited by the party. Reason being that the then General Secretary Hu Yaobang was very open-minded he, was, he called the young intellectuals by, uh, like myself to join the party, to change the party. If, that's what he said. He said, if you don't like the party, join the party, change it. Then I joined the party. I'm not, I wasn't a loyal member, but I was a hopeful member. I hoped that I can change the party. So I joined the party as the, almost uh, the youngest uh, party member. And quickly promoted to uh, a middle level of uh, the hierarchy uh, structure. And uh, I was in charge of uh, student affairs. Uh, soon I found that it is more that they change us than we change them. And uh, I decided to quit. I came to the United States to uh, pursue my higher education. And three years after that, the student movement broke out. So I saw a hope to change China. I went back to participate. Then that's the story. Uh, that's my. And my uh, friends, act, act, activist friends, uh, they are, um, some of them are here in the United States. And uh, some of them left the movement uh, doing business. Some of them become, have become very successful business people. And, uh, and sadly, some of them are still in prison. And uh, some intellectuals like Mr. Liu Xiaobo, if you are a Chinese expert, you will know his name. The intellectual like Liu Xiaobo was are under close surveillance of a Chinese government, but not in prison. He can write articles from time to time, abstractly talking about democracy and human rights. So you can talk democracy and human rights abstractly in China now, but don't bring that down to earth. Okay, so people have a different. Uh, uh, destinies, yeah. 
Thank you, uh -huh. Johnny Yang. Uh -huh.